All right, just keep your uh, Bibles open there in James chapter 1, and I'll be preaching through Genesis 40 for the afternoon service. But uh, James chapter 1, verse 22, look at the beginning there, it says, But be ye doers of the word. Be ye doers of the word. The title for the sermon this morning is, Be a doer of the word. You know, brethren, one thing I really appreciate about New Life Baptist Church is the fact that I get to preach. All right, I get to preach the Word, right? I get to study my Bible, almost like a full-time job being a pastor now, you know, preaching the Word of God. But what gives me greatest joy is when I see the Word that's preached being then done in action. You know, people taking it on board, hearing what is being preached, and then growing in the Lord, growing in knowledge in Scriptures, growing in their faith in Christ, growing in love to all the brethren, you know, growing in the work that God has asked us to do. And so one key thing that I just want to start off the year here in 2020 is to remind ourselves the need to be a doer of the word. Yes, it's important to be a hearer, but more important than being a hearer is to take what you've heard and apply it to your lives, okay? So be a a doer of the word. Then look at the verse again, verse number 22, And uh, it gives us the reason why we ought to be doers of the Word, okay? It gives us the reason. Now, brethren, you know, I've I've been going to church pretty much my whole life. You know, I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in a Baptist church, and attended several Baptist churches. And for a lot of my life, I was just a hearer. You know, I sat there in the pew, listened, you know, gained knowledge, heard a lot of things. But it wasn't until I was in my 20s when I started to do the things And here's the danger of being just a hearer and not a doer. Look at verse 22 again. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So think about that. If you're just a hearer, you come to church, you hear the word of God being preached, but you're not a doer, according to the word of God, you're going to deceive your own self. What does that mean, to deceive your own selves? It means you're lying to yourself, right? And um, you will deceive yourself because here's the thing. When you can take what the Word of God says and then make the necessary changes in your life, then you're not being prideful, right? You have to humble yourself to make those necessary changes, and then the Word of God can have an effect in your life. If you're not the doer, you're going to think you're fine with God. You're going to think, well, there's no fault in me. There's no sin in me. There's no area in my life that I can improve. I'm fine, and you won't do it, and you'll think you're fine. You think you're mature in the Lord, but no. Listen, the Christian life is one of continual growth. The Christian life is continually being more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And you'll never be in this life just like Jesus Christ. And so one thing that you need to understand, till, till death takes you or till the Lord returns, you need to be growing and being more like Jesus Christ. So you need to take his words and do it. Or you're going to remain stagnant. You're going to think you're fine where you are. And that is, being, that is deceiving your own self. Okay? I mean, look, even me as the pastor, I'm not up to speed with a lot of what the Bible says. I'm still growing. I'm still growing in knowledge. I'm still growing as a pastor. I'm still growing as a Christian. I'm still growing as a follower of Christ. And none of us can say we've reached where we need to be and say we're satisfied where we are. You know, we've overcome the sins we're, you know, in, the, the, in our lives and that's enough. No, we've got to keep going. We've got to keep striving. We've got to keep this marathon of the Christian life. Now, if you guys can just keep your finger there, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as well. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, stay in James chapter 1 because we will be spending most of our time in James chapter 1. But 1 Corinthians 3, and while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Galatians 6.3. Galatians 6.3 says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So we're thinking just right now, how can we deceive ourselves when you think you're something, but you're nothing? And that's what happens when you're not doing the work of God, when you're not taking what you've heard and applying it to your life, you're going to think you're something. You're going to think you made it as a Christian. Oh man, how much God owes me for walking after His ways. No, you're nothing. And you're deceiving yourself. You know, the only righteousness that we can stand uh, before the Lord with is the righteousness of Christ. All right? And our walk, our spiritual walk, we need to continue striving for perfection. But verse number four says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself and not in another. This is really important for you to understand. You know, if, to not deceive yourself, you need to prove your own work. When you hear God's word, you need to say, Well, how does this apply to my life? 
You know, when you hear God's word, it's not time for you to say, well, I know brother so-and-so needs that sermon. Or I, I know sister, so- oh yeah, but thank God pastor's preaching on that because sister so-and-so, she really needed to hear that one. No, you're proving your own work. Focus on yourself first. What is it that I need to change in my life? Because it's when you're focused on the others, on other people in the church, then you're deceiving yourself because you think you're, you've met the standard, all right? And people need to get up to your standard. No, you need to, all of us need to get up to Christ's standard, right? Christ's standard. You guys are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Now, should we, be, should we be striving to be wise in the Lord? Striving to be wise in the Scriptures? Yes, but the only way you can become wise is if you allow yourself to become a fool first, a fool in comparison to God's Word. Because you've got your opinions, you've got your philosophies on life, okay? But if they don't line up with the Scriptures, if they don't line up with the Word of God, it's time for you to become a fool and take on the wisdom of God. That's how you become wise. If you're not doing the work, if you're not doing the, what you hear then you're, you're lifted in your own wisdom. And actually, God will say, well, that's foolish. That's being foolish, okay? So make sure when you come to church, when you listen to preaching, whether it's me or it's one of the other preachers, you say, well, Lord, I need to do what I've heard, okay? Start there. Make yourself a fool so you can gain the wisdom of God. And if you guys can go back to James chapter 1, I'll read to you some other passages. 1 John 1.8. 1 John 1.8, a very familiar passage to us. It says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Why is it that we need to hear and do? It's because we all have sin. You're going to sin for the rest of your life, brethren. But here's the thing. We need to reduce the sin. We need to overcome those sins. We need to live more righteously for God. And if you're not willing to say, well, I have sin. Well, yes, what I've heard today has an effect on my life. I need to change this. I realize the sin I have. Well, you're going to be deceiving it yourself, and the truth is not in you. And you say, why is it then? Why is it that we deceive ourselves? Well, Obadiah 3 says, The pride of thine heart have deceived thee. The pride of thine heart deceived thee. See, brethren, if you're coming to church week after week, month after month, year after year, and there are no changes, there's nothing that you're applying to your life, you know why? The pride of your heart. You're, you're prideful, okay? And if that's the case, then that's something you need to change in life, right? You need to have the meekness. You need to have the humility. And we're going to cover, I think it's four points that I have this morning about being a doer of the Word, a doer of the Word of God. Back to James 1, verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. So it's one thing to say you've got to be a doer, but let's see what the Scripture says about being a doer. How is it that we go ahead and, and become a doer of His Word? We want to take what is applicable, and if there's some areas in our lives that we're not doing these things, then you need to change that, okay? And you need to be ready to hear what the Word of God says. Verse number 19, James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, all right, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Point number one that I have for you this morning about being the doer, first of all, you've got to be a hearer. Okay, you've got to be a hearer. What did it say there? In verse number, I'll just back, back in verse number 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. So before we can do the word of God, the first thing we need to do is be the hearer of the Word of God. Amen? Makes sense. We've got to hear it. Nothing wrong with hearing the Word of God. I'm not attacking that side of it. Of course, you've got to hear it first. You've got to be a hearer. And notice when it said there in verse number 19, let every man be swift to hear. What does that mean? It means to be quick. To swift means to be quick to hear. Brethren, when you're in church, it's not the time to be distracted, right? It's not the time to be thinking about, well, what, are, what do I have to do on Monday? You know, what, what is it that we're going to have for lunch? You know, that's not the time. Oh, look, look how brother so-and-so is dressed today. Or look how sister so-and-so... That's not the time, right? When, you, when you're hearing the Word of God preach, you've got to be swift to hear, quick to hear. Pay attention. Don't be distracted, all right? Swift to hear. Proverbs 19 verse 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in the latter end, right? Hear counsel receive instruction. 
That's how you receive the instruction. That's how you receive what you need to change in your lives by first hearing the counsel of God, right? Being swift to hear, ready to hear. Don't come thinking of distractions. And, uh, you know, one thing that made me laugh just recently, Brother Jason, uh, when Brother Jason gets up behind the pulpit to preach, he said to me, sometimes I think I've said something wrong because, you know, your face gets like, looks angry, right? Your face looks angry back there, you know? And I, I've been told that in the workplace as well, where people have not come to my office because they think I'm angry. But listen, brethren, if, I'm, if I look angry at church, especially during the sermon, I'm just in deep thought, all right? It's just, you know, I've got to be like, you know, we've got kids, right? Sometimes on the back, they're holding a little child. And I'm just, my, 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 you know, I'm just like, I've got to listen. I've got to pay attention, right? Because here's the thing. You know, even though I'm the pastor, I can still learn from you guys. You know, you guys have spent the time to study God's word. You get behind the pulpit. You preach. I, I want to be swift to hear, right? And many times I'm holding the little baby, and that can be distracting, distracting. So I'm kind of like holding the baby, and I'm focused, right? I'm not angry. I'm just focused. I'm paying attention, so if there's certain nuggets of truth that have been preached that I'm not familiar with, I can, I can learn from that. You know, I, I, can, I can heed the instruction from the preaching of the other men in this church. But also, as the pastor, I'm very focused when other people preach, just in case you guys make a mistake, right? Just in case you say something wrong, so then I can address it with you after the service or some other time. So, of course, I'm focused on what is being said. And if you see my face looking angry, I'm just paying attention, right? I'm just being swift to hear, and I don't mind if I'm preaching, you guys look angry. It's good, all right? Because now I know you're in deep thought, you're paying attention to, you know, what is being preached. I don't mind if you guys look angry, right? I still got to preach the truth of God's word. But what else did it say there in verse 19? Swift to hear, slow to speak. Why are these things together? It's because sometimes when you listen to preaching, it's going to step on your toes, all right? Sometimes you're going to be frustrated, you're going to get offended, and you'd be wanting to speak, right? You'd be wanting to counter uh, the argument, counter what you've heard there in the Word of God. So be slow to speak, right? The, 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 the weaker hearer is tempted to interrupt. You know, and this doesn't just go with preaching. This can just be in conversation, you know, discussing doctrine. You know, sometimes the men, we get together on a Friday morning to do a Bible study, and we have different thoughts, different guys are, are speaking. And there are times when someone says something that I'm not really on board with, and I can be tempted to interrupt. I can be tempted to say, well, hold on there. No, no, it's actually about this. But no, you need to be, you know, uh, you need to be slow to speak. Pay attention to what is being said. Because once again, by paying attention, being slow to speak, you probably realize, you know, if it is truth, that, you know, you've got to change your view on that. But here's the thing. Even if, even if someone is speaking heresy, even if someone is speaking in error, I'm still slow to speak. Because I want to understand why they believe that error right? Again, it's tempting. You hear someone say something wrong, it's tempting to just jump in, oh, brother, don't you know what the Bible says about topic, blah, blah. That's not going to help that person, right? What, what helps them, if you're slow to speak, you listen, you're swift to hear, you listen what they have to say, then you can work out why is it that they got to that belief? Why is it that they got to that error? Then you can speak and unravel where it is that they've gone wrong. That's helpful to the person that's in error, okay? That's helpful. And, you know, it's really frustrating when, when people have a genuine question, are a, a genuine, genuinely confused about a topic, and they're being shut down when they just bring it up. Hey, they're seeking help. They're seeking guidance. And people are shutting them down with the truth. That, that, that doesn't help them. They need to understand where they've gone wrong in their interpretation of the Bible, right? And that's why you need to be slow to speak. And uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 13, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and shame unto him, okay? Which leads us to the next point there in verse number 19. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. And then this is the, this is the reason why you're tempted to speak so quickly when you're, you know, your toes are being stepped on during the preaching is because you're starting to be filled with wrath. But Bible says to be slow to wrath, right? Is there anything wrong with wrath? Is there anything wrong with anger? No. Okay, these are emotions that God has himself. These are emotions that God has given us. But by being, uh, by being quick to wrath, that is when you're sinning, okay? When you're not paying attention, when you're not letting others, you know, uh, uh, preach the word of God and you're being filled with wrath, you're going to be distracted at that point, okay? And the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 29, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Brethren, if you find yourself getting 
angry quickly just by someone's opinion. That's going to lead you to folly, right? It says here, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. Listen, there are going to be times you listen to the word of God and you're going to be filled with wrath, but be slow to it. Why? Because then you can receive understanding. If you jump to conclusions, you get hot-headed, you're not going to be able to understand what the Word of God says. You're not going to be able to receive God's Word. You're not hearing properly. How can you do God's Word when you're not hearing properly? And you're allowing the wrath of, you know, your wrath from taking over. And uh, the, if you can just drop down to verse number 21 now, James chapter 1, verse 21. James chapter 1, verse 21, which leads up to be doers of the Word. James chapter 1, verse 21, it says here, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So what's the point there? Receive it with meekness, right? What are we receiving? The engrafted word. The idea there that it's engrafted is when you hear it, it remains in your heart. It stays, stays uh, uh, engraven, as it were, in your heart, okay? But you've got to receive it in meekness. That's how you learn, right? Meekness is kind of like humility, very similar words. Humility, you know, when you're listening to God's Word, it's time to be humble, it's time to be meek, and just let the Word of God show you what it, what it, you know, what it has to say to you, okay? And receive it there with meekness. And... Uh, if we uh, just, uh, if you guys can keep your finger there and go to Acts 17, please. Acts 17. So point number one, brethren, was be a hearer. If you want to be a doer, you've got to be a hearer first. A hearer first. Let's go to Acts 17 again. Stay in James chapter 1, but Acts 17 verse 10. Acts 17 verse 10. We get a second principle that's so important for you especially if you want to be grounded in the faith, grounded in doctrine, grounded in knowledge, okay, where you're not too tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But Acts 17, verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, whose coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received, there's the receiving, right? The word with all readiness of mind, right? So these people in Berea, they were ready to receive the word of God, right? They were swift to hear. But look, then what, they, what do they do? Once they've heard it, once they've received it in their mind, and then it says, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Amen. Point number two, brethren, is to search the scriptures daily. If you want to be a doer of his word, not only do you have to hear it, you need to search the scriptures daily daily. It's not enough for you to hear preaching at church. That's not enough. The expectation that we see, what makes you noble, what makes you grounded, is if you take those things that you've heard and you then search the scriptures to see whether those things were so. Does this, would it surprise you, brethren, that there are false preachers in the world? That there are people that will teach you false doctrine? And look, if you're just a hearer, you're going to just receive the false doctrine. You're going to think it's true, Right? But that's what the false prophets are like. They're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Amen. All right? So what you need to do, you've heard something, especially something that is new, something you're not familiar with, something you say, well, that, if, if that's the case, if that's the truth, I need to make those changes in my life. Then what do you do? You go home and you search the scriptures yourself. You look up those verses that were preached. You look up other verses and say, yes, this was true. Okay? Now, look, I'm not saying you necessarily have to do that for every sermon you listen to. Because many of the times we're covering the fundamentals of the faith. We're covering the things that you already know, okay? In those cases, you've, you should have already established those truths, right? You should have already established those truths. But don't rely on the preacher alone. You know, there's been times, and you know, I'm not talking about a false prophet. I'm talking just about real pastors behind the pulpit. There have been times I've heard something preached, and I said, well, that's different. I'm not familiar with that. But I've been convinced by the preaching, Right? And then I've gone home to check it out, and I go, actually, no, that's not right. It's happened, right? Well, why is, you say, why is that? Well, because we all, we all have the flesh, right? We all still have that part of us that uh, we can make mistakes. You know, no preacher is perfect. No pastor is perfect. Nobody has perfect understanding of the Scriptures. But there have been times I've been convinced behind the pulpit. But see, if you've not gone back and, and searched the Scriptures, you would have been left with that false belief. So that's why it's necessary for you to go back 
and search the scriptures yourself. But notice that it said there, search the scriptures daily. Now, what you need to understand, this isn't saying, all right, you listen to a sermon. Now, every day of the week, you need to go and check it out. You know, when it says search the scriptures daily, the expectation there is that you're already a daily reader of the Word of God. You know, you're already in the mornings opening your Bible, reading it. In the, in the evenings opening your Bible, reading it. You're already in that practice where you're doing this daily. So not only are you confirming what you've heard, but just by your daily Bible reading, you know, those truths should be coming out to you, right? If you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost indwelling in you. He's teaching you all these things. You know, you should already understand a lot of whether that's right or wrong, okay? And there, there, I'm sure there are times if you've been in bad churches where you've heard something preached and you know you've been convicted in your heart, well, that's wrong because some verse pops into your mind, right? Because that's your daily reading. That's your daily study of the Scriptures that has given you clarity of thought. You know, I don't mean to pick on Brother Jason this morning, but, you know, sometimes when I preach a sermon, you know, especially where, where I, like if I focus on a, one topic and I go really deep and I answer a lot of questions, Brother Jason comes up to me once in a while and goes, man, that was a slam dunk sermon. All right, slam dunk. You, you just slam dunk it. That's good, right? It's a slam dunk sermon. But here's the thing, that's not enough. Then you go home and you slam dunk it yourself, right? You take the scriptures, you slam dunk it yourself, right? And so it's not enough for a pastor to slam dunk. You know, when you're trying to teach your, your family, your children, you know, you're trying to convince your friends of certain truths in the Bible, you can't tell them, oh, Pastor Kevin preached a great sermon, or some other pastor you listened online or something preached a great sermon. No, you, you've got to be able to show them from your, yourself. You've got to have the confidence. You've got to have the faith in the Word of God that that's saying the truth, and they're going to listen to you because they're your friends. I'm not friends with those people that you know. They know you. They're going to want to hear from you and see the, see the personal convictions, the truths that you hold to, and you can show them that in the Scriptures, okay? Base your doctrines on the black and white things you can see in the Bible. Now, um, if you guys, where, where are you guys? You guys are in Acts, aren't you? Acts. Well, you can go, go back to James 1. I'll just read a few passages to you. And, uh, you know, even, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 4, 4, you know, when he's being tempted by the devil, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, brethren, how often do you eat food? You know, unless you're fasting, it's every day, right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know what needs to be your daily food for your spiritual life? The Word of God, okay? The Word of God. That's what Jesus likens, likens it to, right? You feed your body, food, bread, well, you need to feed the new man, the, 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 the spirit, with the Word of God. That's what nourishes the new man. And Jesus' expectation is that you will do that on a daily basis, and, you know, when Joshua led Israel into the promised land after Moses had passed away, God speaks to Joshua in Joshua 1.8, and he says this to him. He says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt... Now, listen. These are commandments. Thou shalt, right, meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For when thou shalt make, sorry, for, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So what does God tell Joshua? He says, you've got to meditate on the word of God day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is. That's what we're teaching about, right? Being a doer of the word. See, Joshua was a doer of the word. The reason he was able to lead the Israelites into the promised land and have his great victories is not only because he would meditate, hear the word of God every day, but he would then do the word of God, okay? That's the process that God has for us. Meditate in his word, listen to preaching, listen to the word of God, then you go and do it. And, and the promise there was that your way will be prosperous and then thou shalt have good success, you say, why should I do the Word of God? Why should I do what I've heard? Because God will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. That's the promise of God. All right? You know what that means? If you don't do the Word of God, you're not going to be prosperous. You're not going to have success. Now, you may have success by this world standard. You know, this world has a lot of success, but all of it's going to burn. You know, none of it's eternal. None of it's laying up treasures in heaven. You know, make sure your focus is on eternity. You know, when you do the Word of God, God's going to reward you for the labor, for the work you've done in His name. 
So just a reminder, number one, if you want to be a doer of God's Word, number one was be a hearer. Number two, search the Scriptures daily. Okay, search the Scriptures daily. Now let's go back to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 23. James chapter 1 verse 23. The next thing we need to do in verse number 23, it says here, For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, Okay, so this is describing the times you've come to church, the times I've come to church, and I've listened to preaching, but I didn't do what was said. Okay, and if we're all honest, we're all, we can all admit there's been times we've heard some truth, we know we needed to make those changes, and we just said, we're not going to do it, right, because of pride, okay? And this is the example here in verse number, uh, sorry, 23. He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So the, 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 what's being compared here is when you look in a mirror, right? When you look in a mirror, verse 24, for he beholdeth himself, so you, you look at yourself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Listen, brethren, when you're reading your Bible, or you're coming to church and you're listening to preaching, you hear God's Word, that's like, and, and you don't do it, that's like when you wake up in the morning. There's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with this, Obviously, in the morning. This is the comparison in real life. You wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, you fix yourself up, then you go on for the rest of your day. You know, the rest of the day, you're probably not checking yourself out, right? I mean, I would say there's something wrong with you, men, if you're constantly checking the mirror, all right? And girls, you know, it's, it's vain to just constantly be looking, oh, how do I look today, right? Now, look, the, the, the expectation here is you look once, you fix yourself up, you go about your life, and then you forget where you look. Like, it's not important to you anymore, right? You're going about your day, you're doing the work that you need to do, whatever that is, whether that's, you know, at home with the, with the mothers and the children, whether that's the men getting out there and working, you're, you're, just, you're focused on that task for the day, and you forget what you look like, okay? Nothing wrong with that illustration. We all tend, team, you know, tend to do that, right? But then that's being compared to someone who hears God's Word, and God's Word is like a mirror, right? It shows us the errors in our life. It shows us our, our defects. It shows us our problems, okay? So it has that mirror effect, but then when you don't do it, you're going to forget what you were like. You're going to forget the things that you heard, that, that you learned. So point number three, to be a doer of God's Word, is to act upon it speedily. Act upon it speedily, okay? Because remember what it said there in verse number 24? For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway, or like straight away, forgetteth what manner he was, of man he was. You know, brethren, you can come to church and be motivated by a sermon, realize, man, these are things I need to change, and you go home, you can forget almost immediately, straightway, what the sermon was about. I mean, how many times has it happened where you've gone to church and someone says, so what was preached? And you go, I can't remember, all right? Because you're like the natural man that beheld his face in the glass. You knew at that point what it was, and then you've gone and you've just forgotten about it. Now, here's, you know, that's, and when you forget, guess what? When you forget, you can't be the doer. You can't be a doer when you forget. So point number three was act upon it speedily. Do it quickly, all right? Act upon it speedily. So, um, once again, I already used this illustration, but once again, when you're listening to God's Word, don't take the attitude, oh, yeah, brother so-and-so needs to hear it. No, what did it say there? For he beholdeth himself, a natural man, looking at himself in the glass. When you listen to God's Word, look at yourself in the glass. It doesn't say look at brother so-and-so. It doesn't say look at sister so-and-so, because then you're going to forget what you look like. You're not even looking at yourself. Brethren, you need to look at yourself when you hear the preaching, when you read God's word and you say, well, these are things I need to change. Do it. Change it. Do it quickly, right? Or you're going to forget. You're going to forget the, the defects that you have in accordance to God's word. So let's drop down to verse number 25 now. James chapter 1, verse 25. It says here, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, when the Bible says the word deed, that's the work, the action, the doing of God's word that's been referred to there. And so what does it say here? It says that if we hear God's word, we look at the perfect law of liberty, we continue, we do the things that God asks us to do. We're not the forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you want to be blessed by God today? Do you want God's blessing on your life? 
Well, does it say you can be blessed just by hearing? No. You, it's not about being the forgetful hearer, the doer of the work. This man, the one that is the doer of what is heard, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, God blesses the work that you do. If you take something from Scripture, no matter how hard it is for you to live by, no matter how much you love that sin, and you say, well, God, I need to change this. Please help me make these changes. Please help me walk in the Spirit. You know, God's going to say, well, I'm going to bless you. What an advantage. What a privilege that when God sees you make the necessary changes in your life to line up with His Word, that His blessings are going to come upon your life. And so point number four, to be a doer of God's Word, is to count your blessings. You see, there are already things that you've heard in God's Word that you've already applied in your life. God's blessings have already fallen your way. Amen. And here's the thing you need to do. When you find there's something too difficult in the Word of God, just go back and count the blessings that God has given you in your life because that will encourage you, that will motivate you to do what you've heard. Because you say, well, yes, God has blessed me in the past. God has given me this. God has given me that. God has made my life fruitful. Whatever it is, God has blessed the work of my hands. You know, I've seen the changes in my life. I'm living more righteously now. I can see the improvements. You know, people look at me now and, and uh, you know, I have better relationships. You know, I've been able to win souls. I've been able to show people the way of God. You know, count your blessings and that will motivate you. That will encourage you to continue, continue doing the work that God has given us to do. It's the truth. It is. Because when you can see the reward, the blessings of God, that's going to keep you going. It's going to keep you going, right? And, uh, you know, I, I can relate to this because there have been times where, you know, obviously growing up in, in a Christian home, you know, seeing my folks, listening to the great preaching, I've been able to get rid of a lot of trash, a lot of the sin in my life, you know. And there are times where I'm tempted to say, well, Lord, I think I'm fine now. I, I think I, I'm, I, I'm okay. You know, I, I think I'm mature enough as, as, as a believer, but no, so when, when, when I get to that point where I, I, I might be stagnant in my growth, I need to go back and say, well, hold on, no, God's, you've, God, you've blessed me so much. You've given me so much for walking in your ways, and that needs to push you forward to keep going, keep going, and serving the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Luke eleven twenty eight, and he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it, right? Blessed are they that hear the Word of God and keep it. That's how you're going to receive God's Word. You keep it. It's, it's engrafted into your life. And uh, um, if you guys can go to Psalm 119 now, Psalm 119, you don't need to go back to James chapter 1 now. I'm done with James chapter 1. Go to Psalm 119 for me. You know, one major blessing you can have in your life that you may not necessarily consider as a blessing, but it, sh it sh uh, surely is, is that when you've been able to clean up your life from sin, when you've been able to find victory over certain sins in your life, that is a great blessing because sin destroys your life. You know, sin destroys people around you. And when you're able to overcome sins in your life, then that is one of God's blessings in your life. But look at Psalm 119 verse 11. Psalm 119, verse 11. It says here, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Okay? How do we keep God's word in our heart? Well, I just read it to you in Luke eleven twenty eight. Blessed are they that hear the word and keep it. Hear and keep it. That's doing the word of God. Putting it into practice. Putting it into your life. Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart. That's taking God's word, applying it to your life, memorizing that scripture, right? Helping you overcome those sins in your life that I might not sin against thee. The only way, brethren, that you're going to have victory over sin is when you can keep God's word in your life. That means you can't be the forgetful hearer. You've got to be the one that keeps it. You've got to be the one that does it. Drop down in the same chapter to verse number 158, please. Psalm 119, verse 158. Because now we have the, the, uh, the comparison to someone that keeps God's word in his heart. Look at Psalm 119, verse 158. It says, I beheld the transgressors. All right, so the psalmist is saying, look, I'm looking at the transgressors. I'm looking at the wicked. I'm looking at the sinners. And was grieved. Why? Because they kept not thy word. They kept 
not thy word. So what's going to happen, brethren, if you don't keep the word of God? If you're just a hearer but not a doer, what's going to happen? You're going to be a transgressor of God's word. You're going to be a sinner. You're going to continue in your wicked ways. You're going to continue in your bad habits, in the sins that you're not having victory over. You're going to continue in those ways. That's why you've got to be the one that hears it and keeps God's word so you can have the blessing of overcoming sin in this life. And once again, brethren, we're never going to fully overcome sin. That's the nature of the Christian life, the dual nature, the old man versus the new man, the flesh versus the spirit. But one thing we can strive for by doing God's word is that we would spend more time in our life in the spirit, more time in our life pleasing the Lord and less time given into the lust of the flesh. So please go to Matthew 7 now in conclusion. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, please. And uh, again, a very familiar passage, uh, but it's, it's a perfect passage to conclude this sermon on. So Matthew 7, verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine... So there's the hearing, right? Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, so you've got to be open to hear God's word. But then it says, and doeth them, right? So the one that hears and does them, he says, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. You want to be a wise man? You want Jesus to say, wow, that is a wise brother, that is a wise sister, that is a wise father, that is a wise mother, those are wise children, that is a wise pastor. You know what you need to be? You need to be a hearer and a doer of God's word. And he says that man is building his house upon a rock. Now when it comes to the term house here, again, this can mean multiple things. This can be your life. Okay, that you're building your life, your Christian walk upon the rock. This can be your family. Your house sometimes is referred to your family in the Bible, right? Building your family, the foundations of your family upon the teaching of God's Word. What else is a house? The church is called the house of God, right? New Life Baptist Church needs to be built upon the rock, right? This is why we can't just be hearers. We need to be doers. So we're ensuring that our church is built upon the rock of Christ's words, all right? So whatever it is that you're building, maybe you've got a business that you're building. Whatever it is, build it on God's Word. Yes, even your secular job. Build it on the principles that God has laid out for us in the Scriptures and do it in accordance to God's ways, okay? Don't do it in accordance to the way the world tells you to run a business. Do it in the way that God tells employers to treat employees and vice versa. Build it on what God says. That would be building upon the rock. Verse 25, And the rain descended... And the floods came. So, brethren, let's stop there. When you build upon God's word, when you listen and you do God's word, does that prevent the floods and the rain from coming? Does that prevent tribulations and uh, you know, persecutions, trials and tribulations coming in your life? No, it doesn't stop it. Okay, But when it does come, it says here, And the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Brethren, I don't want New Life Baptist Church to fall. You know, there are churches that fall all the time. There are churches that are closing down all the time, okay? New churches starting up, churches coming down. You know why they fail? Because they've not built, been built upon the rock, okay? And we say, what does that mean? It means the church was full of hearers, but not doers. Or maybe what they heard was not even true. You know, they were listening to a false prophet, a false preacher. No, to ensure stability, to ensure longevity in our church or in your life, in your family, you need to build upon the rock. So when the trials come, when the difficulties come, it remains standing. That's the promise that Christ has given us, right? It says there that it was founded upon a rock, that it fell not. You know, the rock represents stability, strength, power, and longevity. That's how we're going to, you know, persevere. That's how we're going to sustain ourselves. You know, uh, till the Lord comes back or till death, whatever it is, we need to make sure we're founded upon the rock. Verse 26 and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, so brethren, this is about us, okay? You're listening right now to the sayings of Christ. And doeth them not. Do you want to be what we're about to read, okay? This could be you. You know, you're hearing God's word, but you're doing them not. Shall be likened unto a 
foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Brethren, if all you do is come to church and you hear, but you don't do, Jesus says you're foolish. You're foolish. You know, just accept it. You're foolish, and you're not building your house upon, or you're building your house upon the sand. Verse 27, and the rain descended, so the same trials, the same difficulties in life are going to come, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I've seen great men of God fall. You know, I've seen pastors that I look up to fall, okay? Say, why do they fall? Because they preached God's Word, they heard God's Word, but they themselves did not do God's Word, okay? That should not be the example that a pastor has before his church, all right? A pastor ought to be someone who's at least living out what he preaches, right? And here's the thing. If you're not doing it, your life is going to fall. This isn't it could fall. It may fall. It will fall. And not only will it fall, but great was the fall of it. Great will be your fall. And this is the, this is the situation, brethren, when we see churches collapse, when we see pastors fail, you know, or, or, or families breaking up, you know, divorce, kids, you know, not being obedient to their parents, you know, failing in your job and, you know, being a total loser. It's simply because you did not build your house upon the rock, okay? God's instruction is sufficient for us to live our lives. And I don't want you to have that great fall. I don't want New Life Baptist Church to have the great fall. So, you know, brethren, in 2020, this is what we need to do. When you come to church, say, well, I'm going to listen. I'm going to be swift to hear. I'm not going to be filled with pride. I'm going to be willing to make the necessary changes that I need in my life. And then you go home and you do it. You search the scriptures, confirm it for yourself, then you go and do it. Okay. So in summary, brethren, what are the four things that I wanted to focus on? How can you be a doer of God's word? Number one, be a hearer. Okay. Number two, search the scriptures daily. Number three, act upon it speedily. And number four, count your blessings. Keep yourself motivated to serve the Lord. Let's pray.